I live across the street from an abandoned development. Housing, business, I don't know. Whatever it was supposed to be doesn't matter now. It's just several acres of raised land ribboned with buckled asphalt roads. Twice a day, I leash up my husky and run along those streets, losing myself in the warren of loops and deadened roads. I'm not afraid. Together, my dog and I can handle anything and anyone. Besides, it's empty out here. There's nothing to see and there's nowhere to hide. The dry dirt between the roads is laced with tumbleweeds, foxtails, and the occasional dandelion patch. Sometimes ground squirrels pop up, driving my dog into a frenzy before dipping back below the ground. I even recognize some of the squirrels by sight and have named them Striper, Spot, Bean, Elephant. I've made this run for three years now, every day since my husband died. Even though we never ran this route together, We'd always planned to. Sometimes I can almost see him on my periphery, short and compact, with curly brown hair and a broad, smiling face. That's why I spend so much time running in the development. It's when I feel closest to him. So I know these streets like the back of my hand, a tract of flat, useless earth surrendered to weeds and lizards. They are empty. But last weekend, I saw a building there, I immediately brought my dog out to explore. The early morning light possessed that tangerine gold quality peculiar to October. Bright, but somehow too heavy to completely see through it. From a distance, I thought I was looking at an outhouse. Maybe a joke, I thought. A prank or even an art installation. As I drew closer, I saw it looked more like a large wooden playhouse the kind rich parents built for their kids back in grade school. I felt a phantom pang of envy. I stopped in front of it just as sunlight broke over the distant hills, turning the ground to white fire and momentarily blinding me. My dog heaved sharply against the leash, like she always did when she saw a squirrel. It caught me off guard, and I lost my balance and fell. My arm shot out to break my fall. The leather leash knotted painfully under my palm and a sharp rock cut my other hand. I watched, disgusted, as fat drops of blood pattered to the ground. <sighs> Mary, I said. She dropped to her stomach, but continued to inch toward the playhouse until the leash was taut. The light was brighter than ever, throwing every pebble and grain of sand into sharp relief. I shielded my eyes and followed her gaze. A doll stood by the open door, small and plump with cascading blonde hair. It was pretty standard except for one rather unsettling anomaly, an open, cavernous mouth. Its hair fluttered in the wind, sun glanced off it, streaking it with copper, and then it moved. Mary bolted. I tried to grab her leash, but it whipped through my hands, taking the skin on my palms with it. The doll spun around and skittered into the building, Mary chased after it, bushy tail disappearing into the shadows. You, you didn't see that, I told myself. It's a trick of the light. She went after a cat or something. Mary! I shouted. Mary, come here! A crashing sound emanated from inside the playhouse, followed by a painfully shrill yelp. Panic eclipsed reason. I love this dog. She was all I had, and beyond that, all I had left of my husband. I ran into the playhouse. Cool, damp air and the overpowering scent of cedar swept over me. I blinked, struggling to see through the murky shadows. Small figures surrounded me. On the floor, suspended from the ceiling, arranged on shelves, eyes gleamed from every direction. Every hair on my body prickled as my skin began to crawl. Stuffed animals and dolls filled the room, spilling from display cases and shelves piling on the floor, glaring from the windowsills. Tigers, giraffes, cougars, dinosaurs, wolves, all kinds. And even more, gargoyles and dragons, stomach-churning little monsters I couldn't name. But the dolls were the worst. Babies with holes in their heads and ruptured glass volcanoes for eyes. Deformed men with the twisted bodies of tortured spiders. Women with pebbled skin and cracked mouths bursting with crystal teeth. 
One doll stood out among the crowd of stuffed nightmares, though. Its skin was mottled blue and gray, and its head had a shrunken aspect not unlike a decaying jack-o'-lantern. Otherwise, it was horrifyingly and beautifully familiar. Curly brown hair, a broad face, and a ridiculously wide, cartoonish smile. My husband. A doll in the image of my husband, painted to look like a grinning corpse. I realized I was hyperventilating. I spun around and then screamed. An enormous monstrosity stood before me with a dozen yellow eyes and three pairs of cruel horns. It took a long, heart-stopping moment for me to realize it was a statue. Something shifted in the corner, slithering and somehow unwholesome. And just then, Mary's yelp broke the stuffy silence. I whirled around just as a second door opened on the other side of the playhouse. I caught a glimpse of Mary's white fur and wild blue eyes, and then the door slammed shut. I charged at it, slamming into a shelf and sending a cascade of stuffed animals to the floor in the process. I scrabbled for the knob, dust-caked crystal gleaming like an ember in the dull light spilling through the filthy window, and opened the door. Wet wind billowed into the room, carrying the scent of rain and pines. And I froze. Dark storm clouds quilted the sky. A buckled asphalt road stretched before me, lined with little houses. Gray mountains towered in the near distance, jagged peaks disappearing into the clouds. Trees choked the landscape, dark and wet and full of dripping leaves. I looked over my shoulder, and the other doorway was directly across from me, framing the abandoned development. It was bathed in golden sunlight, dry and bright as ever. I almost turned back, but instead, I steeled myself and stepped into the rainy village, scanning the street for Mary. Another blast of wind gusted through. Leaves rattled all around me, spilling cascades of trapped droplets to the ground. Something hot spilled down my hand. I jumped, half expecting to find Mary licking me, but no, it was still bleeding where the rock cut me. Another drop splattered on the road. I clenched my fist and strode forward. Dull, lightless windows peered through heavy foliage. Each house had a vibrantly painted door, at odds with the peeling, moldy siding. It reminded me of all the dreary little towns I'd seen in Washington State, except nothing was green enough. It all looked drowned and dead, like an undersea village torn from its foundations and washed up on a freezing beach. The street curved to the west, where it abruptly ended in a massive tangle of briars, bracken, and ancient trees. It was several feet taller than me, thick and impassable as a brick wall. The briars made it impossible to climb. Thorns the length of my thumb proliferated. They pierced my shoes effortlessly. Somewhere behind me, a door slammed. I whirled around and broke into a run, scanning the houses. Dark windows, dull and splintered empty and abandoned, except one, where I'd seen a damp, molded, splotch cottage just a few minutes ago. I now saw a perfect little dollhouse. Firelight flickered behind clean, stained glass windows. I ran over and pounded on the door. It shuddered under my fists, dislodging dust and clusters of fine white hair. Hello, I yelled. Hello, the door creaked open, a huge, Bloodshot eyes stared back at me. A thousand colors spun within the iris like a lightning storm. Yes. My throat closed up. I swallowed hard against a sob. Uh, have you... Uh, have you seen my dog? The eye traveled up and down my body. No dogs here. Not in my house. Only children in my house. As they spoke... Faint, phantom cry seemed to rise from the floor. My mouth worked soundlessly, and then I whispered, uh, Where are the dogs? With the dog eater, of course. Or perhaps, it said hastily, the menagerie, depending on certain factors. W where's the menagerie? The eye narrowed. The watchman is coming. You'd best leave. N no n no where's the mena- Goodbye. The door closed with a short, sharp crack. It was like I'd been released from a spell. I stumbled away, whimpering, and hurried back to the street. 
The sky was noticeably darker. Rain spattered against the road like a drum. The storm was coming. Mary! I yelled. Wind suddenly came shrieking down the mountain, washing over the street like a tide. Ice and freezing raindrops peppered my skin, and then spilled everywhere, swirling around me in thick curtains. I shielded my eyes and ran for the playhouse at the end of the street. I could just see it. A dark, indistinct shape with golden light in its heart. Another blast of wind shoved me to the side. I spun around to avoid losing my balance and caught a glimpse of the road behind me. A billowing, black shadow glided through the storm. Terror like I'd never known trapped me, weaving together with a paralyzing sense of enchantment. The shadow came closer, sure and silent as a raptor. A ball of brilliant blue light blazed to life and bobbed through the curtains of freezing rain. I turned and kept running. Mary! This was my last hope, that she would hear the order and obey. Mary! Go home! Come home! And then I heard her. A short, bellowing bark coming from the playhouse. I broke into a sprint, and just as I reached the playhouse, another blast of wind buffeted me off course, slamming me into the corner. Lead and agony exploded through my body. Through the pain and rain, I caught a glimpse of that bobbing blue fire. I forced myself to walk into the wind. It chapped my face and froze my mouth and rendered me nearly blind. But the promise of Mary, Mary waiting for me in the golden October desert, kept me calm. My fingers finally closed on the doorway, and with my last burst of strength, I ran into the wind, slid past the threshold, and shut the door. Stuffy silence closed around me. My skin, cold and covered in goosebumps, was crawling. I could feel them staring. I looked up and stifled a gasp. They were looking at me. Every animal, every doll, from floor to ceiling, all staring in my direction. It was absurd. Under any other circumstance, the accusing stares of a thousand toys would have maybe been funny. A shadow shifted in the opposite corner, and the floor creaked. I dropped down, but it was far too late. A hulking figure trudged through the brown shadows. It peered over the work table, fixing me with an orb-like orange eye. A bulging forehead gave way to hollow, papery cheeks that exploded into a lumpy deformity of a chin. Its body was thick with stubby legs and an overlong torso. Absurdly thin arms ended in delicate fingers that stretched the length of my forearm. It frowned, then smiled. A tangle of milky teeth slid forward, reminding me hysterically of my grandfather's dentures. It clambered over the table with a shocking impression of weightlessness, snatching a doll off the counter. It settled itself across from me, tucking its legs like a preschooler at circle time. Eyes gleam like dirty domes. Its smile widened, and it extended the doll. I wasn't entirely surprised to see that it was my husband's doll, sunken and decayed, a macabre representation of death rendered in finest porcelain. I looked up, and the creature smiled encouragingly. I tried to smile back, but burst into tears instead. Looking mortified, the monster hurriedly set the doll to my side and stood. It rifled through the toys on the counter, chose something, and pressed it into my hand. Then it set the doll in my lap and stepped back, waiting. It was a tiny, stuffed baby, twisted and malformed. I glanced at the husband doll and back at the baby, and then I began to laugh. The monster clapped its hands and reached down, pulling me to my feet. He ushered me through the toy shop with as much chivalry as an old Hollywood gentleman. I tried to avert my eyes from the toys, but I couldn't quite manage. Just before I reached the door, one of the stuffed animals caught my eye. It was a dog with luxurious snowy fur and a curly tail and bright blue eyes. Mary! My heart imploded. Her eyes watched me closely as the other toys. But there was something else in there, I thought. Desperation. Recognition. I snatched her off the table. For a second, I thought the shop had exploded. I spun around, panic-stricken, and saw the monster in a rage, bulging eyes, blood streaming from his nose. He puffed up like a bullfrog, head brushing the ceiling, and roared. 
Goku's jaw fell to his chest, bursting with milky fangs. The flesh of his cheeks billowed absurdly, sails in a high wind. I, I tried to run, but he lunged and swiped, explosive pain erupting across my face. I stumbled toward the door, shrinking away as he hit me again. He reared back and screamed. That moment of paralytic rage gave me just enough time to bolt out into the development. I sprinted home, sobbing. The moment I got inside, I collapsed and set the toys on the carpet. The deformed baby with bulbous yellow eyes and raw, red skin. My decaying husband, covered in grave mold and rot. And my husky. Out of the three, she was the only one that was whole and normal. I settled back and watched them for a very long time. Around dusk, they began to move. I chalked it up to dehydration and stress at first. The jerking movements and warping little twists could easily have been shadows, but then they grew. Shuddering and popping, cracking and splitting, the three of them bubbled up like gravy in a forgotten saucepan. I ran to my bedroom and locked the door. The sounds were horrifying. Barking and laughter and a shrill, multi-toned wail that made my head spin. After a while, everything became silent. And then I heard my husband's voice, achingly familiar, warm and indistinct, cooing. My door rattled in its frame, startling me badly. Then Mary whined. I nearly collapsed with relief and she scratched the door again. I opened the door and she bounded into my arms. I pet her for several minutes, profoundly relieved and terrified at once. She was normal, whole, unhurt, exactly how I remembered. Hope built in my chest. If Mary was fine, then maybe my husband. I stood up. Mary immediately went on alert and shot forward, blocking the doorway. I pushed her out of the way and staggered to the living room. He was sitting on the couch, back facing me. The sight of his hair thick and curly, a rich, burnished russet, drove my breath away. My knees threatened to give out. I closed my eyes for a moment. Look at you, he murmured in a gentle sing-song. Go to sleep, go to sleep, and good night. He crooned a lullaby to the baby cradled in his arms. A baby we never had, except we did. We had one now. I opened my eyes and moved closer. His hair was messy, unbrushed. That made sense, of course. I'd surely roughed him up when I carried him home. I drew even closer and stopped. His skin was mottled, gray and blue and dull, fish belly white, marbled with black and green. I saw something near his ear, a runnel, a frill, the way your cheeks look when you're smiling too big. And it was too far back, this smiling frill, much too far. I remembered his doll form, how very wide that painted, toothy smile had been. It's all right on a doll or a cartoon, but on a man, a flesh and blood human, something glinted in his hair, dull, white squirms of matter nesting through the dirty tangles, worms. He turned slightly. His eye was narrowed in a perpetual squint of mirth. Past the swollen lids, I saw a wet, grayish lump crawling with worms. His mouth opened as much as it could through that frozen nightmare grin, his yellow teeth glinting. I ran back to my room and slammed the door. The baby began to cry, a throaty, wildly harmonic scream, like a dozen monsters wailing in a chorus. Mary herded me toward the closet. I covered my ears and darted inside. After she followed, I pulled the door shut and curled up in the corner. The baby's cry grew steadily more deafening, and Mary kept whining. I shrank farther and farther, trying to escape the memory of my husband's face, and only dimly aware of the tears streaming down my own. Suddenly, the baby's cry cut out. I exhaled shakily. Then my husband knocked on the bedroom door. Mary barked and barked and my husband knocked again, growing more insistent every second until he was pounding. He did it for hours. I buried my face in Mary's side and wailed until my head hurt. At some point, I broke down. I sat up, ready to go to the door and let him in, along with whatever monstrosity he carried. And then the sun broke over the horizon, flooding my room with sunlight. And the knocking stopped. 
footsteps skittered away from the door. I strained, but heard nothing else. Finally, even those stopped. Mary suddenly yelped and seized. I reached for her to no avail. She twitched and shuddered, shrinking wildly. And after only a moment, I found myself clutching a perfect stuffed husky. Only its eyes seemed alive, alert, full of fear and hope. Only when the sun was high did I venture out of my bedroom. I found the husband doll and the baby doll on the sofa. I wrapped them in old newspaper and tattered clothes, ignoring the way my skin crawled when I touched them. Then I dropped them into a cloth duffel bag and headed out to the abandoned tract. To my horror, the playhouse was nowhere to be found. The development was empty. I ran anyway, praying that it would erupt from the ground like a bizarre flower a brush-choked triangle between three roads, and waited. Nothing. The bag bulged as my husband kicked and screamed. Small fingers bit cruelly through the cloth, scraping my hands. And the baby, that baby, its hideous harmonic wail cut through my head and sank into my mind, roiling back and forth like a trapped tide. In a fit of terrified rage, I hurled the bag on the ground. The baby's echoing cry cut off abruptly. A man's horrified scream rose to take its place. The fabric squirmed and tinted, then draped over a tiny figure. Through the cloth, I saw the husband doll cradling the baby. I watched, horrific and entranced, until he began to sob. I snapped out of my reverie. It was almost night, I realized. The sun had long since disappeared behind the hills. I ran home, bursting through the door just as the moon crested. Mary was waiting for me. She threw her head in the air and howled with joy. I picked her up and stumbled to the sofa. She fell asleep curled against my lap. I sat there, wide awake, not because I wasn't exhausted, but because I saw my husband. Out my living room window, across the street, deep in that dead tract of land. I saw my husband. He staggered blindly through the darkness, wandering the looping roads like a phantom. He carried something in his arms, pressing it to his chest like a precious treasure. I waited all night for him to stumble east towards my house, to cross the road and knock on the door, but he didn't. When the sun rose, he disappeared, literally in the blink of an eye. I crept to the window, heart pounding, and scanned the development. But he wasn't there. He and the baby were gone. Mary hopped off the couch and sidled up to me, pressing her nose into my hand. I turned around just as she seized. I watched helplessly as she shrank back into her stuffed animal form. I don't know why she's whole and well. Perhaps because she wasn't dead. After all, they'd taken her alive. Or maybe the dog eater didn't have time since I snatched her up so quickly. I wish my husband was well but he isn't. I know because every night I sleep on the sofa with Mary, and every night I see my husband wandering the buckled, broken roads with that hideous parody of a child. Every night he comes a little closer. I know I should leave, but I'm afraid for the people who will live here after me. What if they have children? Little kids who will wake up one day to see a toy-filled playhouse across the road? No, just no, we can handle anything, Mary and I, anything, and one way or another, we will handle this.